We all like to win games. We all try to win games. You play the game. You're winning the game. Or at least you're trying to win the game, right? Right. I'm going to argue that most of you are not actually seriously trying to win the games you play. Most people do not try to win. Or at least they think they're trying to win, but they're not actually putting in the full effort necessary to truly be a winner. Yeah, like you're counting points, you're doing your stuff, but you're winning at about that same 30% rate among three friends that everybody wins. You're not that guy that everyone's like, oh, he always wins games. So we have to give you some warning before we continue. If you stay in this room, we're going to take you somewhere. We're going to take you to a kind of sad place. That ferryman is not going back the other way. This is a one-way trip. I'm not going to drink this way. So, three bad things will happen to you if you stay in this room to the end, and one good thing. <laughs> the air hockey problem. So whoever here is like really good at a particular game, maybe you're really good at Street Fighter or something like that, yeah, and your friends don't want to play it with you because they are not also as good. Right? So you can't get to play that game you really want to play. Well, if you follow our advice and start winning at games, like we are really good at air hockey, people aren't going to want to play those games with you, and you're just not going to get to play them unless you find pros at a place like that. And yep. the rest of the year, you're just not going to do it. And even then, there's a big gulf between not good at games, pretty good at game, professional. It's like, a desert in that area. I can beat every person that I know at air hockey. If I go to air hockey world championships, I might as well not even show up. <laughs> Two, the turn-taking problem. You will hate all of your friends for the rest of time if you get good at games. When you're good at a game, you usually play it pretty quickly. Right? You know, someone who's bad at a game is someone who has to sit there thinking for a long, long time. So if you play a game and you're used to playing really, really quickly and you play with someone who's not as good and they take a really long time, that is very stressful. Yep. I mean, the other day, like, I had a conversation, I overheard this conversation, someone was saying, oh, I like games like Seven Wonders, my problem with them is that I don't always have time for a three-hour game. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> like, Seven Wonders for us is like 45 minutes tops, so, with expansions. If someone takes more than five or six seconds on their term, I start getting antsy. Three, the Matrix problem. Not only will you make all of your friends not fun anymore, you will make games not fun. You will see through the matrix. You'll sit down at a board game, brand new game, your friends are super excited about it. You'll be like, oh, this is obviously just like a direct competition, open information game. I'll win by doing blah, blah, blah. And you'll just like, you'll figure out the whole game without even playing it. And then your friend's going to feel really bad. <laughs> One good thing will happen, though. You will become not just a gamer, but a player of games. <laughs> this is so a here's great this book. All right. Assignment, everybody, summary. Read this book. The idea is that a lot of us are good at a game. We're good at some games. We're good at some aspects of games. If you understand games at their core, you will become good at all games. Even games you've never played before, games you've never seen before. By learning these core skills, you will get better. It's like leveling up as a fighter in D&D, but you also learn magic. And you also learn stabbing. Backstab. <laughs> <laughs> So let's get right into this. You keep because saying that word. Game. Game. What is a game other than visual pilots? He kills your father. <laughs> <laughs> so the trouble with the term game is that if you pay attention to gaming discussions a lot, especially lately, people really take umbrage with uses of the word gamer. Gamer. That's not a game. You're not a gamer. You just play casual games. What does the word mean? What does it mean? So if you're an insufferable pedant, you'll want to go to the dictionary. And the trouble is, the dictionary does not really help out your cause. I mean, an amusement or pastime. That covers pretty much everything I do on a daily basis. You need to. <laughs> but, I mean, the trouble is, colloquially, we as gamers, we all know what we mean. When we're talking about game, we mean pheasants. <laughs> so, it turns out, let's talk about some games. Patty cake. Do you consider patty cake a game? Well, I mean, a baby could theoretically lose a patty cake. But there's no points. It's not like the mother gets, like, one victory point every time the baby misses the cake. Is that how it works, this cake? <laughs> I thought there was just patty in the cake, which is sort of the name. <laughs> so, colloquially, we call this a game, but yet there's no way to really win or lose. It's an interactive amusement at best. I think we all agree this is a game, right? Candyland is a game. There's almost no one who would say that Candyland is not a game. But if you think about Candyland, if you actually know the rules, you don't make any decisions during Candyland whatsoever. All you do is flip over the cards and find out who won. 
right? There's nothing you can do to make yourself win at Candyland besides what I did as a child and stack the deck to give myself a plus eight. <laughs> but that's sort of cheating, which you shouldn't do. It says right on your badge. No cheating. <laughs> Number four. So we all agree that Candyland is a game, but obviously we're not talking about how to win at Candyland because there's nothing you can do to win or get better at Candyland. What not about games like this? This is a game. No one's going to say that's not a game, yet you're not testing any skill. You can't win or lose a game like that. And these are actually not the kinds of games we're going to talk about today. Right. People, most people don't realize this, but you know, in, in the video, uh, the movie industry is the MTAA, right? In the music industry, there's the RIAA. In the video game industry, there's the ESA, the Entertainment Software Association. Even the video game industry itself recognizes this is entertainment software, not a game. Most of the things that people just colloquially call video game are really just entertaining software, and there isn't actually a game by a strict definition. Yep. So, so this, this amazing piece of software. So we're not going to talk about this stuff, but there, there's a pretty simple answer. You know how to win at single-player games like this? Enjoy them. If you're not enjoying them, you're losing, and you should probably stop playing. <laughs> so if you talk to game designers, or people who are kind of more in the game industry or paying attention, and you ask them, what is the definition of game? They'll usually say something that boils down to one of these three things. Yeah, number two is the Sid Meier definition, right? Yeah. Series of interesting decisions. And we can break all these down, but again, at least one of you is an insufferable pet. So for the purposes of this discussion, Richard Garfield has actually saved us. Because in a book that he wrote with some friends called Characters of Games, he gave us a word, ortho game. Ortho game describes exactly the kinds of games we're talking about right now. The games you can actually win. Yes. A competition between two or more players, so not puzzles, using an agreed upon set of rules and a method of ranking. You have to be able to win and lose, there has to be a way to determine who wins or loses, and there has to be more than one player. So that, that is, yeah. so that is all we're talking about. The next time you meet the insufferable pedant who's arguing with you about the definition of game, just use the word ortho game every time, and you will be the insufferable pedant. <laughs> <laughs> So, there's one more thing we really have to talk about, one more definition before we get going. The idea of utility. That's the carrot. When you're playing a game, what are you trying to do? You're trying to get victory points, you're trying to get score, you're trying to win the game. Winning is your utility in this case, being higher ranked than the other people you're playing with. And sometimes you play a game with someone who isn't going for the same utility. You're trying to win, get victory points, or finish the race first. Someone else, maybe they're in a marathon, and their goal is push as many people over as possible. <laughs> right? That's what we call an alternate utility. Their utility is not the utility they're supposed to have, and that's what we call a troll, right? Or griefing. griefing right? Griefing is usually the word, right? Someone in World of Warcraft who just kills you and camps your corpse, right? That's griefing. They're not trying to win and level up and do the things they're supposed to be doing. So we're assuming in this discussion that you at least, whatever the game is, the game has victory points. If that's how you win, that is what you're going for. If you're seeking something other than the core utility, winning the game, then really this talk doesn't apply to you, and also, your friends probably hate you. Do you have friends? I don't think the person has friends. <laughs> All right. All that aside, what we really want to do is give you very specific advice, because the point of this is I want you to all go out for the rest of PAX and beat all, all your friends is left in injury time. at every game you play for the rest of this weekend. Of course, if two of you are in this room or are going to play a game against each other, I'm sorry, only one of you will win. <laughs> so what you two need to do is look at one of the slides that's coming up later and then get a third friend to play with you. <laughs> Heuristics. Humans can't do differential calculus by birth. Even the ones who know differential calculus. <laughs> but at the same time, if you toss a ball at a young child, they will often catch it. So how are they calculating where that ball is going to land? If they can't do the math, they can't, they can't look at, like, they don't know the force of gravity and the wind and everything. They can't, like, do all this complicated math, and yet people catch balls pretty reliably when you throw them at them. It turns out there's something that humans do called the gaze heuristic. If you throw a ball at someone, they will turn their head up and lock their neck at an angle where they can see the ball. They will then move their body forward or backward, left or right, to ensure that that angle never changes. If you do that, you're guaranteed to catch the ball. It's a heuristic. We're not calculating the speed, the velocity, where it's going to land. We're using a heuristic, like a simple rule. I will follow this simple set of rules, and if I follow them, I'm guaranteed to achieve a particular outcome. So, in games, 
there's game theory, there's math. We talk a lot about how, you know, game theory and how you can calculate the states of games, but we don't do any of that crap. We can't do that math. Yeah, so there are mainly two different kinds of heuristics, right? The first important one is the directional heuristic, how you decide what to do. The gaze heuristic is a directional heuristic, right? It is a process by which I figure out what my next move is going to be. Okay, so we have two bridges here in Shadowgate. How do I decide which bridge to go on? Do I well, go on the bridge looks pretty nice. or the really safe looking bridge? This one's got snakes on it, too. Are those snakes? I was thought they were just sort of snakes. I think the broken step here is an indication that I should not go over here. So your method of, your, your directional heuristic is choose the safest bridge. Okay. That's exactly what I'm going to do. By default, my heuristic, if I see two bridges, whichever one looks safer. Alright, that's a good directional heuristic. Yeah. Alright. Decisional heuristics. So, how do you know who's in first place? I mean, Mario Kart. It says, oh, Rim's in first place, uh, Waluigi's in second place, other Waluigi's in third place. But you all know, you've played Mario Kart. That is not true. First place is really third place. Second place is first place, unless the gap between second and first is so small that the blue shell explosion hits both of them, in which case third place is first place. So if directional heuristic is how to figure out, based on where I am now, what do I do next? A positional heuristic is, based on the board, or the game, or the state, or all the information I have, who is winning? Where am I ranked among the other players? A level one positional heuristic in Mario Kart is, oh, my fancy microphone just fell off my head. Wow, that was money well spent for you. It was. Mine's working uh, great. I spent all that money on this thing. <laughs> the game says I'm in first place. I'm in first place. A level two heuristic, I know that second place in first is, is, is actually first place based on this complex heuristic. A level three heuristic, I've actually analyzed the source code and I'm running a debug mode thing on the cartridge that's paying attention to where everyone is and is calculating a real-time game state based on odds. Sometimes a positional heuristic is easy as look at the score, like in a 100 meter dash, whoever's in front is winning, right? It's, there's no question. No one's that. bluffing in a 100 meter dash. <laughs> <laughs> The same ball is just holding back. <laughs> right? But in some games, the score is completely hidden. In Tigers and Euphrates, your cubes are just hidden behind a shield. You don't know what anyone's score is unless you've been counting since the beginning of the game, and you haven't been. There's no way you haven't been. It's impossible. So in all games, remember these heuristics. Come up with simple rules to follow, and then as time goes on, make those rules more and more complex. You can be that jerk who plays a board game like a choir and calculates every turn who is winning and the exact number of victory points. Play tic-tac-toe and try every possible combination every round to figure it out. That's not fun, and probably you won't actually get better at games if you do that. You need to develop heuristics that you can make snap judgments. You can almost intuit how to win games. People talk about analysis paralysis, which usually is a situation where someone has really bad heuristics or really inefficient ones, and they have to think for a very long time to take their turn. And as you said before, someone who's not good at a game is someone who takes a long time to their turn. If you have, you're going to win in a game, you have really good heuristics, and you take your turn quickly. So, some games. This is our first main tactic. How many of you have played a game called Yahtzee? Yeah. Okay, wow. so we've been to places where like, people haven't heard of Yahtzee, so we've got to check. Yahtzee is a component of many other games. King of Tokyo has Yahtzee in it. Roll Through the Ages has Yahtzee in it. Lots of these games, if you play them, it has all this other stuff going on, but there is a sub-game within the game. In this case, Yahtzee. Yep. If you play Half-Life, Half-Life has a shooting game in it. It has a platforming game in it. It has puzzle games in it. Right? So if you've learned those sub-games separately, when you go to play a big game that has lots of sub-games in it, you'll be good at those sub-games because you've already played them. Yahtzee specifically is a good one to get good at. If you, at any point when you're playing Yahtzee, have a difficult decision to make, your heuristics are not good enough yet at Yahtzee. There's and actually a website you can go to where you'll play Yahtzee, and they will have a bot play the same Yahtzee that you played, and then at the end, it will give you a ludicrous number of incomprehensible statistics comparing how well you did versus how well the bot did. To see, are you truly as good at Yahtzee as you can be? I was very happy with the way that bot ranked us. <laughs> But Yahtzee specifically, get really good at Yahtzee, you'll start being better at calculating odds, you'll be better at making quick decisions. Yahtzee is one of the best games. It's like, uh, well, you know what? It's like exercising with a heavy baseball bat. Table so tower games. That doesn't work. Well, no, what doesn't work is swinging with a heavy baseball bat right before you're going to swing for real, because it gives you this perception that you have more control, when really you've just fatigued your muscles. So tabletop games, a lot of our examples will be from tabletop games, but we're not telling you how to just win tabletop games. The reason we use tabletop games as our examples is because they're like 
exercising specific muscle groups. Tabletop games are physical. They have to fit within this sort of conceptual space. A human brain can hold the state of the game in their head in most tabletop games. You can understand what's happening. By getting good at these kinds of games, you're, you're exercising those individual brain muscles. The shortest path. So sometimes you play a game, and the game, the first thing a good instruction book is going to tell you is how to win that game, right? Counter-strike, bomb the spot, or cat rescue the hostages, yep. or kill the whole other team. Right? In a game like Kalis, get the most victory points. So the first time you play a game, right, you've just learned it, you're playing it for the first time, you should look at that very carefully. And when it says get the most victory points, the next thing you should do is say, where are the victory points? They're in the castle. The yep. thing that takes up a third of the game board, maybe it's important. Right? Why is it taking up the entire top of the game board? Maybe what I will do the first time I play this game is do nothing but play, mess with that castle. And you know what? That will win 90% of the time. Yep. In particular, this is like an easy heuristic. If you're learning a new game with friends, don't do anything complicated. Whatever the most straightforward path is to victory, do it. You'll probably win, and then drop the mic and never play that game again. <laughs> <laughs> right? Most people play a game like this for the first time, and if they're not the kind of person who plays to win, they're going to mess around with what looks fun. Ooh, this sheep. Ooh, this gold. Gold is awesome. Why don't I mess with that? And then at the end of the game, it's like, oh, I have like 10 points. Yeah, I have like 100 because I actually messed with the castle that is taking up a third of the game board. So, positional heuristic number one, a very simple one. If you're looking at a game, if the rules talk a lot about one part of the game, pay attention to that part of the game. So, some games will have what we call a degenerate strategy. So, degenerate strategy is basically a BS easy way to win. Oh, I push one button and I win. So, push that button. Yup. So, this is a very famous example. When Mario Kart came out of the DS, there was a problem in that you could do a very physically uncomfortable thing called snaking. You basically had to hold your DS and go like this with it. And you were basically guaranteed to win. You would lap people if you did this and they were not also doing it. Thus, the only way to win this game was to snake because everyone was snaking. If you didn't snake, you were guaranteed to lose. This was this strategy overpowered every other strategy. Yeah, this is usually what people mean when they say something is cheap, right? Because usually you're thinking, well, the harder something is to do, the more powerful it should be. If there's something that's really easy to do that's way more powerful, that's not cool, right? Because then anyone with a very low amount of skill can get a great amount of success. It should be more skill, more success, less skill, less success. But in this case, it was simply more thumb endurance. Now you so might say, you're really Scott, skills. it's a bad game. Sure, yes, it's terrible when games have this. Degenerate strategies are the things that keep game designers up at night. But you're not designing a game, you're winning a game. <laughs> <laughs> so if you play a bad game, either A, don't play it, which is a good idea in the case yeah. of Mario Kart DS, or B, the snake. <laughs> the Pareto Frontier. There's an idea in game theory and other uh, maths called a Pareto Efficiency. Let's say this is a fighting game. So this is my strength. Down here in the bottom left, that is the strongest, fastest character you can be. And up here, the further away we get, I'm slower. The further away we get, I'm weaker. I have a lot of decisions of characters I can make. Uh, and they're all trade-offs, so this character might be a little bit faster, a little bit stronger, yeah, so, a little bit weaker. Yeah, so you got like the Zerg is up in one corner, they're fast and there's a lot of them, you the Protoss in the other corner, and it's Terran somewhere in the middle, you gotta let it be. So, if there's a lot of decisions in a game, there is a way to sort of calculate, either mathematically or in a more complex game, just sort of intuitively, that some decisions are just worse. For example, say this is uh, Ryu, and this is uh, M. Bison. They're equal in the sense that they both are equally powerful in different ways. I have to give up something to get something. I have to give up something to get something. There is no character you can pick that is simply both stronger and faster than Ryu and Dan Bison. You're gonna, right? If you pick either one of them, you're gonna be its okay choice. So Dan Hibiki is hanging out back here. He is just slower. He is just worse. He is in every possible way objectively worse than other choices. I can make a different choice, get something, and give nothing up in return. If you want to win at games, only choose characters that are along the Pareto frontier, the edge of efficiency. Everything beyond the frontier is literally just worse. <laughs> Pay to win games. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, you want to be good at pay-to-win games? Yeah. How do you, win, how do you win pay-to-win games? Uh, kill Bill Gates and take his money. Yeah. 
Just pay money. If you're playing a game that has a money component and you're serious about winning it, pay the money. You want to be the best at Magic the Gathering? Open the wallet. <laughs> and if you don't open the wallet, you can't win. Right? Some guy's going to show up with some ridiculous expensive cards and you can't beat him. Doesn't matter what you do. We have a semi if you're ten times as smart as they are. We have a semi-famous example of this of a game store that had a Yu-Gi-Oh tournament. And the game store owned all the best cards. So they took all the best cards together. This is like in the year 2000. There weren't that many Yu-Gi-Oh cards. So they, and the game store had literally like 10 copies of every yeah. Yu-Gi-Oh card that ever existed. They made basically the best possible Yu-Gi-Oh deck money could buy. And they entered it into the tournament played by a 20-ounce bottle of vanilla Coke. Vanilla Coke. Right? Was, this was a regular Coke. This is serious. It followed simple rules about draw a card, play it if you can. Very simple procedural rules. And it came in second place in the tournament. <laughs> So if you really want to win Yu-Gi-Oh, get like 10 friends together, spend $1,000, and make the god deck. Yeah, I talked to the Yu-Gi-Oh guys like in the, in the Motif the other day, and I was looking like, see which card was the most expensive. There was one that was like 60 bucks. I'm like, is that card really good? He's like, yeah, if you play that, you really just win. So $60? <laughs> $60. So, so you, I said, how many cards can you have in a deck? Three. I'm like, well, $180, and I'm the king of Yu-Gi-Oh. <laughs> so $60, $70 times 40 cards equals winning every Yu-Gi-Oh tournament, and you'll make a lot of kids really sad. <laughs> Equipment. So, in a pay-to-win game, right, like Yu-Gi-Oh, the equipment, right, those cards matters a lot more than anything in your skill base, right? But equipment isn't meaningless. So, in golf, you can take Tiger Woods golf clubs, and let's see you go out there, right? It's not gonna happen, <laughs> right? But Tiger Woods with some shitty golf clubs, it's not gonna go too well, right? Like, he'll beat us, still. Yeah, he'll still crush us, but the point is, he won't be as good as he is with the clubs that he knows. A bigger example would be bicycling. Right? I can go and take Lance Armstrong's bike, and I will not be able to get up any of the hills in the Tour de France. It just won't happen. I will die halfway up the hill. <laughs> but if you give Lance Armstrong, even with his roids or whatever, some like steel bicycle that weighs 100 pounds and has one gear, he ain't get up a hill either. <laughs> so if you want to win at games and there is an equipment component where equipment matters, whether it's pay to win in a game where equipment matters more than skill, or a game where skill matters more than equipment, but equipment still means something, buy the best equipment. Right? If it's the Olympics, there's one Olympics where they had the Speedo bathing suits that yep. are just better, buy one of those. You're dumb if you don't. If it's legal and it's better, buy it. Now, many of you might have, you know, your utility is to win the game, but you might have another secondary utility of still be able to afford food. <laughs> but this also feeds into being good at games. Don't just buy the best equipment. Buy the best equipment that you can understand and explain to someone else why it's the best. And don't buy better equipment until you can say, I need that ski because that ski will reduce shutter at high speed, something I experienced while playing. And if you know what that means, then you can buy those skis. If that sounds like something the guy's just telling you to sell you some skis, don't buy them. And in fact, buying the higher level equipment, if you don't really understand, will make you worse at games. Rock climbing is a sport. I rock climb. If I buy the more expensive shoes, I will be worse at rock climbing because those shoes require a different technique. They also really, really hurt to wear. <laughs> and if shoes goes to your neighborhood, I mean, all his stuff is... <laughs> Carcassonne. Did you guys have all played Carcassonne, right? Yeah. All right. We're going to tell you how to win specifically at Carcassonne right now. All right. Yeah, I'll basically never lose this Carcassonne. I lose all the time. So maybe listen to him more than I, me. I have like an 80% win rate. I don't know why Scott hasn't figured this game out yet. I have. I'm just really bad at it for some reason. <laughs> it's tile, I guess perpetual bad tile draws. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just bad luck for the last 10 years. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> so what are the uh, simple positional heuristics in Carcassonne? Well, level one, who's got the most points on that point track? Level two, points on the track and points that are on the board but unscored. Right, oh, he's got a meeple, it's on a road, and it's a three long road, that's three points right there. Right? So I gotta add that into the score. Oh, he looks like he's in second place because he's down by two, but actually that road puts him in first place. He's actually the person who's in first, go get him. Exactly. So the first basic strategy that applies to all games, the kingmaker. Sam Green, I drew this tile. I can't put it here because that just gives red a ton of points. But if I put it here, I can put one of my guys on this, and then if the right tile comes up, we'll join these cities, and us and Red will share the city. If I put my big meeple, I'll get all the points. If I put my little meeple, Red and I will share all the points. Now, wouldn't you just obviously put the big meeple and take all the points and screw Red over? Well, how's Red doing? Red's no. not doing too well. It's not looking so good for Red. 
So, if I put the big maple, I'll burn a bunch of points for red, but red's not gonna beat me anyway. If I put the big maple, red now has zero incentive to finish that city. In fact, by not finishing that city, red will make sure that my big meeple is out of the rest of the game. So it'll actually hurt me. And uh, we need a special tile to fill this city. It's kind of hard to fill that spot. It's not, it's not if I'm trying to fill it by myself and there's five players, for every five tiles that come out, only one tile has a chance to fill that hole. If red and I are working together, two out of those five tiles have a chance to fill that hole. We are significantly more likely to fill the city out. And giving those points to red literally is the same as burning them. Right. It is perfectly okay to work. If you want to win, work together. Cooperate with the people in last place. If there's a move that gives you 10 points and the guy in last place 10 points, freaking great. That's amazing. <laughs> Just don't give the guy in second place 10 points. That would be bad. So this is exactly what you want to do in this situation. And now you and Red are going to bump up. You have a much higher chance of winning the game. Think so, about how you can apply this to other non Carcasso games, right? Maybe you're in a car race, right? And you can draft behind someone. So you get up, you know, with a, with a teammate and you go and it's like, this guy, you know his car is slower than yours, right? You're going to beat him in a, in a straight race. But there's this other guy, his engine is way awesome, his Red Bull, forget it, right? Oh, not this year. <laughs> so you team up with this guy who's worse than I heard that one guy back there who probably pays attention to F1. <laughs> F1, yeah. You team up with him, you pass it around, right? And now the guy can help you pass the good racer while you pass him and you win. Right? Same deal. So, how did Red get in that situation in the first place? The King Breaker. This is where you team up with your dumbest friend. This is where you identify your smartest friend and you wreck them. <laughs> so, we all know Rim is going to win at Carcassonne. So, yep. listen, at the start of the game, everyone gang up on Rim, or else he's going to win, seriously. I'm not so, even joking. If all the other players form a city like this, say there's four players, three out of every four tiles that come up can fill that city in. And these aren't points for these players. These are just negative points against red. If you all gang up, and this is a widely applicable thing, say there's a four-player game. If three of the players agree to royally dig over the fourth player, <laughs> your chance of winning went from 25% to 33%. That's a big deal. That's so a big deal. Of the remaining three players, do it again, and you just raise it from 33 to 50. And you want to make sure that you do this to the player who's the biggest threat to you. Right. You don't do this if red is weak, because what's the point? Oh, great. Red, who was already in last place, gets minus 10 points. Great. Big deal. Right? But if red was in first place, you give him minus 10. Yes, everyone caught up, because we all work together. So the biggest stick, a simple directional heuristic in Carcassonne is every turn, do the thing that gets you the most points. Or do the thing that gets you the most potential points, like farmers. Sometimes getting one point is not as useful as taking 10 points away from the guy ahead of you. Right, so here blue and green are about to get this huge city, the example city, and they're going to get a ton of points. Red can put that thing there, right, that road, and that will really make it almost impossible for that city to ever finish if there's a road aiming at. Now there's only one kind of tile in the base set that can even go in that spot. Right, the odds of that of blue or green drawing that tile are really, really, really low. So basically, putting that road there is negative points for blue and green in terms of minus one meeple. And never forget, negative points to someone who's a threat to you are just points for you. Straight up. So if you can't get a lot of points yourself in a game, who can you hurt and how can you hurt them as much as possible? Right, think about how many turns blue and green spent putting tiles there. Now all those turns are just wasted, canceled out, they scored nothing. It's like hockey, if I can't score a goal, hurt somebody on the other team. <laughs> Notice I didn't put my red guy here. This is where the game gets a little complex, but I made this to dick somebody. Yeah, that road is worth at least three points. Why would you not also, in addition to giving them negative points, get three points if you're by putting it on the road? Because that road's not going to finish. I designed it to not finish. All right, totally different kind of game. Mall of Horror, a vote who wins game. A lot of games are vote who wins games in disguise. Uh, if you want to play them, be someone who gets votes. Arguably, all games that have more than two players or more than two teams of players are vote who wins games unless they're just solitaire. Anytime there's a game where you can mess with other people or do a thing like, like this game is literally just, we're in a room. Let's vote who we're going to kick out of the room and get eaten by the zombies. Let's vote again. It's just a big popularity contest in a circle. So if you recognize that a game is like that, 
you have to really play a sort of psychological game and get people to not notice you, recognize that it's a vote who wins game, and pejoratively call out, oh, Scott always wins the vote who wins games, so don't vote for Scott, never vote for Scott in that game. <laughs> yeah, Mafia and Werewolf is also you know, your classic vote who wins game, but other games are vote who wins games that you don't realize it. So, say maybe you're playing Risk. If you're playing Risk with more than two players, it's vote who wins. Let's gang up on Rim. Okay, two people just agreed to vote that Rim will not win. Yep. Right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter, matter what dice you use, where you put your troops, two people ganged up on you. You're not going to win. It's just not going to The heuristics you can use in these situations are along the lines of not, I destroyed four troops of Scots, but it's simply, I attacked Scott at all. Keep track of how many times each player got attacked, and you'll figure out, independent of everything else on the board, who is likely winning. It's whoever got attacked the least total number of times. So I gang up with Scott to vote for Joey Jojo, and then I gang up with Joey Jojo to vote for Scott. And then eventually I win because I've got everyone to hurt someone else and a person that's a threat to me. And in the end, no one's actually trying to hurt me. That is called, and uh, Richard Garfield talks about this a lot in his book, Characteristics of Games, politics, political games. You have to recognize what kinds of politics are in games. Direct attack. I attack your army in risk. Indirect attack. I put my guy on the baby spot in Agricola, denying you a baby. <laughs> so I'm saying. These are harder to figure out. You need to recognize situations. A lot of games don't seem like you can attack other players. Worker placement games are actually highly political. Blocking someone else matters a lot in those games. The only games that really aren't political are games that are two players. Or, if there's more than two players, it has to be a straight racing game. So there's no politics in, you know, just a running race. Yahtzee! Yahtzee is not political. Just yeah, roll dice. No, if there are more than two players, which means there's an opportunity to vote for people as opposed to I'm always opposing you and you're always opposing me. Or teams, right? You get more than two people, you get two sides. There's more than two sides, and there's a way to interact with other players. Politics enters into it to some extent. All the way up to diplomacy, which is 100% politics. Brinksmanship. Scott's going to win on his turn. Oh, yeah. If you don't take an action right now, Scott will win on his turn. I already took my turn, so it's too late. It's either you or Scott wins. What are you going to do? That's brinksmanship. These are two good examples, Citadels and Civ 5. We're playing a game of Civ 5, like this long online like multiplayer game, and one dude is off on this continent by himself, just getting more and more and more powerful while we're having this petty warfare on this tiny little continent off to the side. So I'm really trying to convince everyone else to go attack him before it's too late. It's already too late. I don't want to spend my resources attacking him, but I want someone else to spend those resources. The Warlord lets me give up money to remove victory points from someone else. I, as a player, if I want to win games, never want to be the one doing that, but I want someone to do it every single round. I want to remove victory points from the game. I want to get Scott and Joey Jojo to just bang against each other as much as possible. Whoever uses the Warlord loses points because they lose gold. Whoever gets hit by the Warlord loses a card. They lose victory points. If other people keep doing that to each other, they're all constantly losing victory points. As long as I am not the target or user of the Warlord, I am going to win in this game. So very specifically, in games, this is a very direct technique. Point at an individual person and explain to them why they have to take X action or else other person will win the game. And tell them, and if you can, tell them that you're not going to take any action. I'm not stopping them, it's you or nobody. <laughs> if I can't win, no one can. So this is a game called Chrononauts. It's like a little card game with you guys. It's really cute. Basically, you flip over these different time periods, like different events to change history. And depending on your character, you're trying to get a certain time configuration in which your character exists. Right? So Gunther exists in a world where 1917 and 1918 are altered in history, and 1950 is normal history. So these paradoxes here. If too many paradoxes are up at one time, the game ends and everybody loses. Because time itself is falling apart. If I'm not winning, remember, we're utility. We're trying to win the game. We're trying to be ranked higher than the other players. If I will not end the game ranked higher than the other players, why not make it a 10-way draw? I'd rather have everyone lose and be even than have Rim win. So if I can't, if I, victory is too far away from me and victory for Rim is really close, I just say, hey, Rim, uh, if you don't do this thing to help me win on your turn and stop winning, I'm just going to make this paradox. You can't stop me and the game will be over. That's your choice. 
The reason we can do this in games is because back to utility. Sure, there's a story about how we just destroyed the world, but you know what? I didn't lose. <laughs> or I didn't lose more than you lost. It's as good as winning. All right, so let's play some paper, rock, scissors. Scott, I'm gonna throw a rock. No, uh, you lied. I lied. So if someone threatens you in a game, ignore it. Ignore when if someone else tries to do to you what we just did previously about, oh, I'm going to let him win. You've got to ignore that. The words people say are just noise. If someone says, don't attack me in risk or I'm going to attack you, literally look them in the eye, ignore them, and do whatever you're going to do anyway. Because it's, it's just noise. It's just a dog right. barking in the he, dark at a mirror. He can't prove to me that he's actually going to throw a rock. Right? There's no, he said he was, but it doesn't mean anything. He can throw any of the three options. They're all equally likely, no matter what he says. Right? So I'm going to pick randomly as well. That's the best thing to do in rock, paper, scissors. It doesn't matter what he threw on the last turn. He can, all options are perfectly equal on the next turn. All right, I'm going to make a credible threat. I'm going to throw scissors. Oh. I already threw it. Okay. Yeah, it turns out in some games, credible threats don't work. <laughs> <laughs> or in some games, threats are credible. No, I made my threat credible. Here's an example. Say there's a game where you play a card to take an action. Maybe I take the card and I put it down early. And I leave it there and I take an action that I cannot take back. I already did the action. I cannot undo it. So as a result, my threat is credible because there's no way for me to back out. I've proven that I'm capable and willing. Doesn't always work in some games. Credible threats are not always useful. But you have to be able to understand the difference between a credible threat and a non-credible threat. The latter must be ignored no matter what. It's the same as bluffing in poker. And you'd be dumb to ignore the other guy. So, how do you make an effective credible threat? So, who has played chicken? Hopefully nobody. <laughs> you know, it's 1950, you've got slick back hair, you want to get the girl or the guy, you're both dressed up in greaser jackets, and you've got mustangs, and you're going to take your cars and go fast at each other, and either swerve or die. You each make one simultaneous decision, do I swerve, or do I not swerve? If we both don't swerve, we both die. If I swerve and Scott doesn't, Scott gets the girl, and vice versa. So how do I make a threat in this game? With our old heuristic here, if, if Scott says, I'm not going to swerve, I'm going to ignore that. Of course he's going to say he's not going to swerve. I always have a full house. Always. There's only one solution here. Take your steering wheel off, throw it out. <laughs> now you know I'm not swerving. No chance. Scott has literally reduced his options. He has thrown away an option that he said, had, thereby forcing my hand. Yep, I am not swerving. 100% guaranteed not swerving. Right, now when you say a 100% rock, that's a bad idea. But 100% not swerving, great idea. <laughs> now to counter this, again, utility. I want to be ranked higher than Scott. If I can't be, I'd rather die. <laughs> That's what you have to do. You have to make winning a higher priority than everything else. If there's something else that is more important to you than winning, you are not going to win because there is someone else out there before them. Winning is number one. Friendship, camaraderie, having fun, those things out the window. <laughs> we told you when you walked in the door, that's what's going to happen. Arbitrary. Most decisions you make in games are arbitrary. Sure, this might be slightly this way, this might be slightly that way, but in the end, a lot of the decisions you make really don't matter. So this is the Russian Hex, the absolute best game you can play on the toilet. Hearthstone's uh, pretty good too. Yeah, so there's 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, there's 19 places you can put that starter tile. But in reality, there are only 4 places that you can put that starter tile. Anywhere in the entire second column, you know, ring, is identical. It doesn't matter which one of those spaces you put it in, it's exactly the same. It doesn't matter. So really, you're only making a decision between four things. It doesn't take that long. You'll know people who take a long time on their turn are people who actually don't realize this, and they are deciding between all pretty 19 possibilities, not recognizing so many of them are exactly like that. Should I throw rock or scissors? Well, scissors are pointy. But rocks are heavy. If you see someone agonizing over an arbitrary decision, you can assume a lot of things about their skill in this game and act accordingly. So quickly, how many unique choices do I have now? If I'm placing my purple guy here, how many unique choices are there? Quick, quick, come on. Three, yes. Three, yes, good. A plus. That's it. So even when the games get more complex, there are still not, you can almost always cleave a whole ton of decisions away. So even here, 
this guy has directionality now. Yeah, you can rotate that guy, so that matters a lot too. And the board now is much more asymmetrical than it was before. Even then, it breaks down. There aren't that many choices. I can remove these choices without even thinking. And you need to be able to recognize that automatically in your brain. And even further, you can eliminate a lot of decisions just because they're inside the Pareto frontier. They're bad news. Yeah, See these little guns? Don't take these guys shoot, right? Even if I choose eight, I can choose what rotation I want. Every rotation that's shooting off the edge of the board, obviously I don't want to do that ever. There's no reason to ever do that. So, even still, I'm eliminating decisions. Yeah, if you pick eight, there's only two rotations that are worth it, not the usual six possible rotations because of hexagon. So you need to be able to eliminate decisions that are arbitrary. You need to be able to eliminate from those decisions, or from similar decisions, options that are either bad, suboptimal or equal to other options. And you need to be able to do this very quickly and you need to be able to recognize when other people do not realize this. So if there's poison in one cup or the other cup or both cups, depending on how long that guy thinks, you know whether or not he's gonna die of poison. <laughs> Acting randomly. So sometimes when you have these arbitrary decisions, if all, you know, in an erosion ahead, it's not all four of those choices were equal choices, right? They were just a few number of them. But in rock, paper, scissors, all three choices are always equal in power, right? In a situation like this, in Citadels, okay, not all the choices are 100% equal in power, but if you choose the most powerful one, that's the one people are most likely to think you're going to choose, and you get this poison cup situation. If people know what you're choosing, then actually the powerful position becomes the weak position if it's known. So in that kind of case, what you want to do is pick red. Like literally, and show, remember the credible thread before? Look the other players in the eye, take the cards, shuffle them, pick one randomly without looking at it, and just slam it down on the table. I do this in Netrunner all the time. Instead of like trying to bluff, like is this a thing you want or is this thing you don't you want? Is it a trap or not? I'll take like two cards, I'll shuffle them by my hand and put one down. And it's like, I don't even know if it's a trap or if it's the card you want. Go for it. It's one in two chance for you. Are you going to take it or leave it? Now, I don't even need a poker face. I don't need to be able to bluff. I don't need to be able to lie. The cards are doing it for me. <laughs> now, sometimes, and you'll notice because Netrunner addressed this specifically, it's very difficult for humans to act randomly. We cannot try to write a string of random numbers, and anyone who knows better can look at your string and tell that a human wrote them. Right. There's a bot online that's very good at rock, paper, scissors, and what happens is you play against it, and it learns your personal preferences, and it figures out your patterns. And because you're a human being and not a computer, you cannot be perfectly random. Even a computer can't be perfectly random unless it's a hardware random number generator. But basically, it will figure out how you play rock, paper, scissors, and over time, eventually, it'll just start beating you. Way, way more than 50% uh, of the time. So Netrunner, they allow, the rules say, you may bring a device to generate randomness. You can have a little d20 and you're just rolling while you're playing yeah. to make your decisions. You're specifically allowed to have one. They said so. And they had to say, and people were asking constantly, like, are we allowed to do this or not? And they said, yes, you may have one. So, so because you're allowed to have one, use it. Equipment. Get it. Don't many, not have one. Many games do not allow you to bring external materials. Like a lot of German board games, you can't bring a pen and paper and just write victory points down. You can't like bring extra dice and roll them on your turn. It's arguable whether or not this is cheating. I'm gonna tell you something that I've done in the past, for real. Uh, I did this in music theory classes and I did it at board games. I will, if I have to make a random decision, look up at a clock. If the second hand is on an even number or in a certain quadrant when I looked at it, I choose right or left. I use the world to generate randomness because I know my brain is incapable of doing so. Yeah, this has nothing to do with winning, but I'll do the same thing in role-playing games. When I need to get a name for something, I'll look around the room and I'll be like, yes, Captain Exit has showed up. <laughs> <laughs> Funny, my brother's name is also Captain Exit. Yes, this room is surprisingly bare. The only thing I'm is Mr. Enforcer. <laughs> You'll have a battle with Captain so, even if, if a decision is arbitrary, act randomly. Act randomly such that other players cannot figure you out and interpret what you're doing and then, and then as a result, like that bot, uh, second guess you, step ahead of you. This plays into a much more complex idea of a mixed strategy. I want to play that bishop. I got to choose a cop. If I play the bishop and no one assassinates me, I get like five victory points. Like, it's just the best. He's got so many blue cards out, he's gonna get so many gold, it's gonna be amazing. Scott's not dumb. He knows I want to play the bishop. He the, knows the blue is... cards are face up. I can see he's all bishop. Yup. Scott could play the assassin and assassinate the bishop. 
Meaning that if I choose the bishop and he assassinates the bishop, I'm screwed. So you might think, well, I should never play the bishop. But then Scott doesn't actually need to take the assassin. The mere threat alone prevents me from getting my points and winning the game. But if I try to choose, I'll take the bishop or not, Scott can try to figure out what I'm doing. I need to make a strategy, a mixed strategy. That's the game theory term. So I might decide in my head, 20% of the time, in this situation, I'll play the bishop. 80% of the time, I will play another random roll. Right, so you do the random thing still, but you before you shuffled up the cards and pick one, you would take the bishop and put it down, shuffle among the rest, and then put that one out there. Or shuffle, right, and then sort of figure out which one the bishop is and then not take that one. Or so, take one, if it's the bishop, put it back, take a different one. So here I have an arbitrary decision, so I act randomly. Here it's a non-arbitrary decision. The decision matters a lot. But I'm not going to let my brain make the decision because my brain's not going to figure it out optimally. But odds will. Odds remove a lot of these issues from the equation, and they give me the chance to play the bishop. But if I play a pure strategy and I always play the bishop, or I never play the bishop, I will get less points overall over time. If you go to a casino and you play games, you lose because the house wins, right? So if you can make yourself a casino, as, and your opponent is now facing the house, and you are the house by being random, that is very good for you. Catching up, this is a picture from that book we keep referencing, Richard Garfield's Characteristics of Games. Who's winning here? Is A winning or is B winning? Is it? What if B rolls a two? So it turns out that there is no such thing as a catch-up mechanism in a game. There is literally no way to have a game that has a catch-up mechanism. If you could have caught up, you weren't behind. That is, I heard a few people going, <laughs> that is crucial to being good at games. If you're in second place with a red shell, the red shell is not a catch-up mechanism. You're in first place. <laughs> but yeah, as a result, you need a very complex positional heuristic. Power grid, initial D, two very different games. Power grid, if you're in last place right now in terms of the points on the board, you get all these advantages in game. You get to go, you get to buy resources first, you get to bid up power plants better, you get to put your house, it's amazing. To be in last place, it's so easy to play. That. Watch a power grid tournament. The people who win will fall into last place. I'm not buying any houses this turn. I want to be in last place, guys. They will bounce off the bottom. They'll bounce off that fake catch-up mechanism to come back later. And less at players will look at Scott and say, oh, Scott only has nine houses. He's not winning. I'm not going to yeah, worry about him. Yeah, you're going to be, oh, I bought all six remaining houses in one turn because I was in an awesome last place position. Initial D, racing games often have this too. The further behind you are, the faster your car is. So the strategy to winning this racing game is stay behind someone until the very last second and then suddenly pass them. Now, if you play Initial D in the arcade, pro tip, you can look online. There's a fact. Hold certain buttons down while the game is starting and Great turn power. that off. So you'll go as fast as you can go, and you can leave your opponent in the dust. Now, bonus points if you uh, trick a kid into holding down the brake pedal and then starting, and then they think that the game will still let them catch up, and it won't. <laughs> oh, what? What? What did we just say? <laughs> Someone's not playing a win out there. <laughs> you better start swimming back to that shore. <laughs> so desperation. In hockey, if, I'm, if my team's losing, and there's a couple minutes left, Pull in the goalie. That's oh, crazy right. to pull the goalie. It'll be so easy for them to score, but they're winning anyway, right? What's the worst that can happen if you lose, which is already going to happen? Okay, fine. But maybe with that extra player, this forced power play, maybe we have a better chance to actually have some miracle combat. Right? If I'm falling behind in Yahtzee, I get to start going for that Yahtzee because I rolled two twos. Go for a Yahtzee every round. Yep. Football. Oh, crap. We're down by a whole touchdown. There's 30 seconds left. Uh, onside kick. Let's go for it. Yeah. Okay. Citadels. Maybe I raise that 20% chance of taking the bishop up to 30% because I really need to take that risk. You're not risking anything. You're already losing. You might as well go big or go home. And when that empty net goal happens, which most of the time it happens, you lost anyway. Oh, no, I lost by a couple more points. I'm still ranked lower than the winner. Yeah, it doesn't, the goal differential doesn't matter in most hockey tournaments, right? So it's okay if you lose by one more. Like an NHL regular season game, you lose by two, you lose by three, no difference. This is a universal directional heuristic in basically all games. The further behind you are, the more risky your strategies need to be. Straight up. And the opposite is also true. When you are far, far ahead, like I'm winning this football game by 30, 
Why would I onside kick or pull my goalie or anything <laughs> else crazy? And stuff. Play as conservatively as possible. Hold on to your lead. Just do the safest possible thing over and over again. And people might know you're doing the safest possible thing, but what are they going to do about it? Your moves are really, really safe. That's yeah. what makes them safe is that they can't do anything about it. Team Fortress 2. My team is up by two captures. It's going to come down to points or sudden death at the end. Take Rather than face. risk a capture, turtle, 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 turtle. Candy boxes. Anyone played this game called Candy Box? Has anyone played a game that's basically Candy Box in disguise? Like, I don't know, the thing on your 3DS or the street passes? <laughs> or Ingress? Anyone play Ingress? Go green team? Anyone on blue team? Ingress? In the after? In the hallway? Candy Box is a game where every second you get a candy. If you just wait, you get all the candies. So, anytime a game rewards you for waiting, or for doing something that costs you nothing, like an ingress, as I'm walking down the street, I hack every portal in the physical world. Like I walk past Pike Place, I hack that portal. If there's no cost, no incremental cost to doing an action in a game, and that action rewards you, do that action infinitely and forever. <laughs> I have a very specific and weird example of this. I used to play semi-competitive Quake 2. Like, yeah, I'm old. Like Weapons Factory, which was the precursor to what eventually became Team Fortress 2. Like that sort of genre of games. And in that game, you could be a cyborg. The cyborg could self-destruct. And what I would do in some of the like, ladder tournaments is my role on the team was to every round, because I had the skill to do this, run into the enemy base, avoiding all the, everyone else, avoiding the midfield defense, Which and blow my skill. Yeah, require some skill, and I'd blow myself up. I would do that every 40 seconds for the entire two hour match. <laughs> If you hit a button, you get a victory point. Just hit that button as much as you can and as fast as you can. <sighs> cards. Extant information. So if you're playing blackjack, count cards. Just do it. If you're playing Tiggers and Euphrates, you better know how many victory points everyone else has. It's really hard to count all those little tiny cubes, but if you want to win, count all the tiny cubes. A lot of games have hidden information or really complex information that is still available to you. It's not completely secret. You can learn it. You know, you play Netrunner, you access someone's hand, you better remember every single card that was in their hand. Right? There better not be any mysteries for you. Yep. Right? If you don't remember every single thing that you've seen and you know, never forget it until the game is over, then you're giving yourself a disadvantage. A lot of games, many of you have probably played a game called Small World. Nice tabletop game. That is actually a reskin of another game called Vinci. And the main difference between them is that in Vinci, you have a score track and you see everyone's score. Small World hides the score because your friends are not actually paying attention to who's winning. So if you're playing Small World, literally, keep track of who's winning. You don't need to know the exact number. That might, like if you're learning a game and you try to count cards 100%, like you try to count in hearts every single card that's been played, you're probably going to mess it up and lose track. Like that's a very difficult yeah, skill. Unless you're some sort of you know, crazy genius, it's just not going to happen. So come up with a heuristic. Counting cards in blackjack is just a directional heuristic. You're just using a meta number, a simple calculation, to decide what to do. So in hearts, I don't count all the cards. I just count the hearts and the aces. And that's all I count. In small world, I don't count the number of victory points. I keep track of who's winning and by how much. And that's all I care about. So and so is winning by a lot. This other person is losing yep. by a whole lot. This only person is beating me by a little bit. I'm going to pass them. In Tigris and Euphrates, I don't know how many blue, red, green, and black things Scott has, but I know he needs black the most and he needs blue the least. So if you want to, you know, if I'm trying to get more blue points, just let me get blue points because I already have so many. If I need black, he's going to stop me from getting black at all possible costs. The full rules. You'd better know what every one of these fucking things does. <laughs> every pixel, every item, you'd better know that this weapon is 10 more DPS than that other weapon, or else go home. I mean, you really want to win, and it's not just each what each thing does. What does each thing do with every other thing? Right? What is the exact build order? Like, if you're playing StarCraft and you don't have a memorized build order, forget it. Why are you even here? <laughs> Seriously. This applies to tabletop, I mean, it applies to sports and hockey and football. You'd better know what options you have if you're falling behind in football. You'd better, better know, know what an onside kick is. If you know what a free kick is, right? You better, when can you drop kick? When can you not drop kick? You know, what's a quick kick? Do you even know what that is? Have you ever seen it? I saw Tom Brady do it once. You ever been playing a board game? And then there's that one guy you don't know because you're playing a pack with a stranger, and he just quietly reaches over for the rule book, and he's looking at something, and he doesn't want to tell you what he's looking at. <laughs> 
So one, memorize that rule book. Two, if someone does that, remember what's on what page in the rule book. <laughs> A lot of games have secret rules. If you want to win at Pokemon, you better know what EVs and IVs are. Right? You want to win at Hearthstone, you want to win at Nourishing the Hex, those kinds of games. You know what every card is. Magic the Gathering. If you're surprised by a card in Magic the Gathering, and you have to read it. That's a problem. You better know every card in the whole game if you want to have a chance at that. So strategies. You want to be good at chess? You want to be good at Go? Read a book. A lot of books. Don't try to figure that out on your own. Read a book, memorize the Polish opening. If you memorize the first four moves of a classical, powerful opening in chess, you will beat 90% of your friends, even if you suck at chess. Memorize a build order. They're the exact same thing. Someone else already did the work. There is already a, a clearly superior path. Follow that path. Memorize that path. That is the most powerful thing you can do in a game like this. If anyone can surprise you with a game where there is possible to already know everything that could possibly happen, you didn't prepare. Sports. <laughs> okay, so a sport. I love that picture. So more definitions again, right? A lot of people like to have these no true Scotsman arguments, but like that's a sport, that's not a sport, whatever. A sport is any game where there's some sort of physical component as part of the skill that is being tested. Street Fighter is a sport. Why? Because you need to move your hands really fast. Chess is not a sport because I don't need to physically move the piece. My ability moving the pieces doesn't matter. If Someone muscles, who's quadriplegic can still play chess. If the muscles in a human body are being tested by the game in some way, right, then it is a sport. So yes, ice hockey is a sport, but so is car racing. You need to move your arms. If, if you used your brain to just control a car, it would not be a sport anymore. Well, arguably, I mean, the brain might still be anyway. So. <laughs> If a game involves a physical component, master that shit. Practice. Play it every day. I'm okay at Counter-Strike because I've played it almost every day for over a decade. So do that to be good at Counter-Strike. Strategy doesn't matter. Knowing the map matters way less than clicking on a dude's head. You want to be the king of tennis? Play tennis every day, all day, until you can't play tennis anymore. Right, we're running low on time, so we're going to do some advanced strategies. These are some pretty particular strategies. This happened in one of the Omegathons. Four player game, the top two players advance. If I go first, I pick a random player and attack him. Scott goes second, what should he do? I see that you're attacking blue, so I'm attacking blue also. Player three should also attack blue. Maximize your odds. If you're playing a game where the top end players advance, pile on whoever falls behind first. You're running from the zombies and someone trips, kick him. <laughs> Be honest, don't tell your friends. But be aware of how clever your friends are. If, you're, if you have a friend who's not that good at math, befuddle them in the course of games when math is involved. Don't bluff against your friend who's bad at the game. They won't realize you're bluffing. If they're looking at a place on the board a whole bunch, what are they looking at? Look at people's eyes. Someone will look at the thing they're going to do next, and then you can figure them out. That's such a problem in this game that they provide a hat in the box. <laughs> You just knocked me out of the game by attacking me then. I'm pretending that he's losing when he's winning. If you believe him and your positional heuristic isn't any good, you'll stop attacking him and then he'll win. I'll get serious. I'll get so petulant and pissy. I'm like, man, fuck you guys. I'm just gonna, whatever. Let's just finish the game. Come on, hurry up. I'm done. Uh, oh! <laughs> What amazes me is that despite doing lectures like this... It keeps like this, working. <laughs> I'll show people this video and then they'll lose in the very next game. Talk about the game. Talk about the game. After you play a game, oh, I won because you did... You moved that I time. lost because I made this one mistake on turn three. That was it. That was it. That was it right there. Let's play again and let's not make that mistake. You've got to talk about the games you Both play. Both teams play hard. hard. Exactly. We played hard. It was a good game. Both teams played hard. It's fine. Play a shit ton of games. We played Puerto Rico, a board game, five or six times a day for an entire summer once just to master the three-player version. Play so many games that you lose track of them. So our assignments here, because we're pretty much out of time. Homework. There's a game called Stratego. I want you to figure out how to always win Stratego against someone who is under the age of 14. <laughs> There's a name for the best possible way. We call it Bombs and Bullshit. If you email us, and you just... Bombs and bullshit. 
If you can if you can describe to us how to beat any child at Stratego, then you have ascended to the next level. Or you can just watch one of our previous panels on YouTube where we gave it away. The moral of all of this, because we gotta get out of here, we'll be able to take some questions in the hallway, and if you grab a flyer, we'll try to have video and you can see other like this. this. Taking the place of the flyer. Yes, lots of videos of all our other PAX panels. But seriously, play games, try to win, but really try to win. When it's your turn, be thinking about what to do. When it's not your turn, be thinking about what to do. Don't be thinking about getting beer or anything. Think about yeah. your Distract everyone around you, but you're thinking the whole time. If you lose a game, figure out why. If you win a game, figure out why. If you don't know why you won, you lost. <laughs> be a dick. <laughs> Said, don't be a dick. Be a dick in the context of the game. <laughs> Within the game, it's okay to attack someone for the win. Outside the game, it's like a good game, bro. Yeah, you gotta shake hands after the game. You've got to be the most horrific genocidal dictator the world has ever seen inside of that game of Civilization V. But you've got to be a human being outside of that game. For real, you think. So Enjoy you, the remaining uh, injury time impacts. Grab a flyer if you want to email us a question. We'll be out in the hallway in a few minutes. And give us a round of applause for the interpreters here because they were working really hard. Game mechanics, yeah! yeah. <laughs> Everyone loves game mechanics. It's a word, yeah, it's a word that's thrown out all the time, phrase, whatever, right? What is a game mechanic? Anybody? No. No one, no one even raised their hand. One so, guy's trying, but we're not going to let him answer. We're I mean, in a first-person shooter, like, is shooting a mechanic? Is, like, gun collection a mechanic? Is just an entire game a mechanic? What if I play a game, and that game determines who plays the next game? Right? So, what is a game mechanic? The fact is, if you look on the internet, if you try to look at research and books and Wikipedia, right, the definitions for game mechanic are so vague as to include so many unrelated things.